I'm so strange, I forgot though the reason that we're using the microphone and the podium <clears throat> and a little bit of formality is because we are recording and we hope that we could uh, give today as a gift to the family and so yes, we are going to go ahead and record so we'll all have a good a good memory of remembering Neil. Gosh, this is a doggone hard day. You know, it was just a little over two months ago. Isn't that hard to believe? Late December, just before Christmas. Um, I'm sorry, Cindy, or was it just after? Was it December 27 or December 20, December 23rd? Yep, yeah, just before Christmas, that we learned uh, that Neil had left us. <clears throat> And it seemed rather cruel, I think, to all of us that such a gift to our community would be taken away. And I know we all know that. And the fact is we are just not here today to be sad. We are here to say it's been a little over two months and it's a good time to remember all the good times and good things and happy moments and how real affected all of our lives. And particularly today, it is a great day to remember Neil, not just as <clears throat> a great member of his church, and I know several of you are here from the church, and we thank you for hosting a beautiful passing for Neil. But not just that, not just his role as a leader in our community, a civic leader in our community, not just as a college professor at Times, a writer for the Times, but also as the artist, inspirer, motivator, innovator that Neil is. And I say is because the real part about being a legacy is not that you live on, but that your work lives on. And we all know that Neil's work lives on, frankly, in each of us gathered here today, but certainly in our community. So on behalf of the Shreveport Regional Arts Council, and some of our board members are here, I just want to recognize them for a moment for their vision to host this opportunity for us to come together. Joe King, the president of Art Space, would you stand up, Joe, just for a moment? Thank you so much. <laughs> And Bruce Allen is our Vice President right here. Thank you, Bruce. He's going to be leaving us today, of course. And Jody Glorioso is our Public Art Director. Jody, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And as I, I, do, I think I, I hope I have one for, oh, there's Henry. He came down. There is Henry Price, our President right here. Henry, come on up a little bit into the light where we can see you, please. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I also just want to recognize the team. There is a new team at the Arts Council, and sometimes we talk about, oh, well, you're leaving. I think we ought to be, did I, oh, Andy Sheehy, thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Andy, thank you very much, track board member as well. Thank you. All right, who else did I not see? You know, the room is different, so I had to room memorized, and now the room is different, and everything seems a little foreign to me, so okay. I hope I didn't miss any room, but I also want to thank the staff of Art Space, the team here that um, is going to lead the next direction for Neil. I hope you all have heard the rumor that Anne-Marie Gerhardt, who's the new director for Art Space, Anne-Marie, where are you? Please, just... Uh, all right, there she is, is going to work with Bruce Allen to bring back the 25th anniversary of Portraits 2000. So I think we we'll all see one of Neil's true legacies and hopefully the rebirth of that incredible program when we open that in January of 2025 and celebrate the 25th year of Portraits 2000. But also I want you to meet beyond Anne-Marie Gerhardt here Haley Curtin is our art space associate and social media coordinator. Is Jane here? I don't see Jane. She's downstairs. Jane, thank you ever so much. And here to make today also happen is our new executive director for the Shreveport Regional Arts Council, Rebecca Bonnevere. Rebecca, step into the light. Come in, come in the light, you know. 
We're really excited and fortunate to have Rebecca come from the Berkshire arena, where she likes to say it. She managed big name artists and never got out of the building, and now she gets to make our artists big name across the world and get out of the building and into the community. So that's Rebecca Bonavir. And I also want you to know, if you don't already know, Casey Jones, our marketing director, right over here. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Austin Jennings, our technical director. Thank you, Austin. I don't see Xavier, but I think Xavier and Rachel have been around, but I, I don't see them up here, so I'll stop there and say we have a, a wonderful team leading the way today. So on any given morning, Monday through Friday, if you were lucky enough or sick enough or twisted enough to be up early and decide that you were going into work, me by car, uh, you would see the musketeers. Sometimes there were three, most times there were four, sometimes there were five. But they were always together in the Highland and South Highland neighborhood on their bikes and also walking and always also talking. They were never a group just to exercise. As a matter of fact, I wonder, I mean, they all look great and physically healthy and everything, but you know, it really never seemed that it was about exercising. I didn't see them break a sweat, and I also never saw them break a conversation. And there were, it seems to me that the four of them in their walks and their bike rides and their talks contributed to what our arts world is today. Andy Sheehy, I will not discuss the political world that you want me to go in, but I will say they shaped the arts world as we know it today. So Bruce Allen, our vice president, was one of among them. Alan Berry, where are you, Alan? Right here, Alan Berry, thank you. Uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Hendricks, thank you so much. And Andy Sheehy also, did not usually have a burial or a funeral before 8 in the morning. And you could catch him also kind of last, tagging along, asking who's hosting coffee. Andy Sheehy, too. So, Bruce, will you bring everyone up and start our memory of Neil today? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Um, I just want to, let's all, we'll all come up for a minute here. The, that we called ourselves the Walker Group. I'm not exactly sure. Well, because we walked a lot. And in fact, there's a photo downstairs that Neil took of a walker. It's that blue walker down there. And he made t-shirts for all of us. And we wore those. I think we wore them once, anyway. <laughs> and then we, uh, all right, great. And uh, every morning, gosh, since what, 2008 was when we started walking together. and. Uh, we would walk and talk and uh, have a great time every morning, and we cer certainly miss that time together. So um, I think each of us will say a little bit as we introduce some other folks that we have asked to come and speak, and then at, uh, after we've had those people speak and we've spoken a little bit, then we'll ask for anybody who else would like to say something. We'd glad to have you um, pitch in your own memories of Neil. So I'm going to start with Andy to um, introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Bruce. Just a, one note, uh, Jeff and Bruce are the old men of the Walker group. <laughs> Not bad. They're much older than Neil and myself, and then Alan is the baby. We're always jealous of Alan because he's a lot younger than the rest of us, and sometimes we were more focused on breakfast at George's Grill or Strong's than we were on the uh, physical aspect of our exercise. So I'm going to call up my uh, former church mate from St. Paul's Episcopal Church, Paul O'Neill. We were all at St. Paul's in our formative years along with Dorothy, Christy, Hannah. You tell the to those bikes. Why do I have to be first? I am Paula O'Neill and I worked for Neil Johnson. Oh yeah, sorry. I was 11. Uh, I worked for Neil Johnson as his office manager from February 2002 to February 2020, 18 years almost to the day, 12 years full-time, 6 years part-time, 30,000 hours, but who's counting? Uh, working for Neil was great. I got to meet so many friends and clients, and he trusted me to do what needed to be done. I worked independently, and he joked that he wanted to take pictures, and I should just do the rest, which I tried to do. <coughs> Excuse me. 
When I started work for Neil, I knew about him, and I had my photo done for Quilter 2000, and I had admired his work all along. My dad also had his portrait done. Um, but as we worked together, we became friends and often talked about our personal lives while sitting on that beautiful balcony at 1301 Louisiana. It was a newly remodeled building. It was an old Jitney jungle. I'm sure you all know about that. But it was such a special place and such good energy, especially on that balcony. He was single at the time, and we often talked about his dating life. Many years prior, I worked at KSLA, and I knew Cindy from her work at KNSS and KSLA. So when her name came up in conversation, I was quick to praise her as someone you might really like. And you know the rest of that story. Neil knew how to pass a good time. And there were numerous parties and celebrations at that studio. I knew I had landed at the right place for work when one of Donna Service's wonderful sculptures, Fienar Eminence, was hanging in the display window. Each year he would hang a new eight foot long print in that window. I'll never forget the year that he hung an extremely tasteful black and white female nude in that window. I think a group of Jesuit boys had a minor accident at that intersection, but I can't be sure. <laughs> One of the ladies on the street also had something to say in lipstick on the window. He was out of town. I shot a photo of it and then cleaned it off. <laughs> I don't think they were too happy. Maybe competition. What do you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me. We also got one or two calls from some upset older women. Jealous? She but one day, a policeman, I think it was a state policeman, came to the studio, and when I welcomed in, him into my office, he said, I think you know why I'm here. Have what? Every transgression flashed before me. <laughs> was it a parking ticket? Was it that joint I smoked on the balcony? I don't know. <laughs> he was good like that. <laughs> anyway, he pointed down to the window and he said, I think you know why I'm here. Right, I did, sorry, I said that already, so, anyway. He said that the law states that no female breast nipple shall be displayed in public. That really riled me up. And I couldn't believe that something as tasteful and beautiful as that was being censored. So I begged Neil to find a way around it. We talked about photoshopping a male breast nipple, but thought <laughs> that would be too much explaining. But we thought about it. Excuse me. Um, then I talked Neil into letting me hang an American flag on the nipple, which I was so proud he let me do, and it remained that way for the rest of the year. <laughs> then there's Popa Felton. He wasn't always purple, you know. Our friend videographer Scott Crane, who had an office in the building for many years, found a baby armadillo in a field that he was mowing, and he brought him into the studio thinking Neil might like to take pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. He was a cute little cuddly fellow, and we were very careful when handling him, knowing that they carry Hansen's disease. We decided there had to be a story behind him, so we began to make one up. What was he doing in Shreveport? Perhaps he was from Texas. We thought, what's a good name for an armadillo from Texas? Bubba wasn't quite right. So Neil opened the phone book, did a finger search down the page, and found the name. Felton. A few other names ensued, like Odelton Felton, <laughs> to honor our beloved arts mentor, Odelton Harrison, may he rest in peace. So what was his story? Neil speculated that perhaps he'd been to the boats by himself, leaving the wife and kids at home, and lost too much money, got drunk, or whatever sort of armadillo trouble you can get into here. So Neil made a huge square canvas print of Felton, and it hung at Artport for many years. The art piece was required to have a title, so here is Felton's title. Felton, knowing he had a lot of explaining to do, crawled slowly back to Texas. <laughs> that original image graced a billboard in the area, and at that time, I believe, Neil decided to make him purple, so purple Felton was born. <coughs> Excuse me. And he too graced a billboard, just a lone armadillo on a white background with no text. Trust me, those billboards got a lot of attention he became our unintentional mascot. One of Neil's many book projects was taking photos of baby animals, specifically from Louisiana. Jim Wasserman, his assistant photographer, and now my dear friend, and I helped him shoot mosquitoes, crawfish, snakes, ducks, alligators, catfish, 
possums and three adorable baby raccoons, courtesy of Daryl Rubuchet. While the book never made it to print, a local pediatric practice hung many of the images in their building, and I'm told it made the kids really happy. One of my favorite studio shoots was of a hawk. He had been injured on I-49 and was laying in the center of the road. Someone brought him to kneel at the photograph. I adore raptors, and being able to see a hawk up close was unforgettable for me. And what a wonderful group of images Neil got. After consulting with wildlife authorities, we determined it would be best to return him to near where we found him. It was a profound experience. He had recovered and flew away easily. Gee. As you know, Neil's support of arts was remarkable. He shot for many entities, often for free or trade. He loved the opera, ballet, symphony, theater, and public radio. He loved the R.W. Norton Art Museum and the grounds, and they were a valued client for many years. Some of you might know that Neil's father, Mel, grew beautiful camellias, some bearing his name. I believe some of those camellias graced the grounds at Norton, but don't hold me to that. During camellia blooming season, Mel would often come into the office with a bamboo tray covered with camellia blooms from their yard. <clears throat> they were spectacularly beautiful, and Neil loved to display them as well as take pictures of them. We often handed them out to clients. Mel and his beautiful wife, Lee, were lovely people, and I was privileged to get to know them as well as his children, his ex-wife, Rita, and his siblings and their families. When his parents died, he moved into the house on Erie Street that his grandfather built over 100 years ago. You may not know this, but his grandparents actually started Southfield School in that home. That home where he lived in his later years and Southfield School were near and dear to his heart. He loved photography, but I believe his ultimate passion was writing. His two most well-known books were Louisiana Journey and Shreveport Bossier, both published by LSU Press. During the Clinton presidency, Louisiana Journey graced a table in the Oval Office, and Neil had the White House photographer shoot a photo of that, which he proudly framed and hung in the office. His New York literary agent was still a part of his life when I arrived. He had about 17 books and ongoing royalties for many of those with several big publishing houses. When his agent died, he continued to pursue his love of writing and publishing, but was never able to publish again. He self-published a small batch of books entitled People, which contained many of his favorite portraits. He is very passionate about the last book that he worked on before his death, about the photographer Daguerre. One of his favorite quotes was, running never ends. He truly never stopped being inquisitive, childlike, creative, and I so loved him for that. So did we all. And that laugh, oh my God, loud and unfiltered and often heard in the offices. I can still hear it now. Jesus, baby. We dressed up for Halloween every year. And if you bear with me, I have a photo. Anybody back here? So, you get the idea. We had a wonderful time. It was a really creative and, and fun atmosphere, and I felt very loved. Gotta find my spot here, y'all. I hope everybody's okay. It was hard to narrow it down to just a few stories. We both had our moments of forgetfulness and laughed that we made notes for everything. We called it brain on paper. We had a system for when someone came into the office whose name he could not remember. He would pull his ear, and then I would use their name in conversation. If I didn't know their name, I would introduce myself. Hello, I'm Paula Renew. But if it was someone I was supposed to know, and someone he was supposed to know, oh my God, you can imagine. <laughs> We were close friends throughout, and as sometimes happens, we would argue like an old married couple. I used to laugh and call him my work husband. I hope she doesn't mind. Poor Jim learned to just shut the door, knowing we'd be fine after it was all over. Our relationship was like that. I knew he loved and trusted me enough to know that a simple argument would just not be enough to end our relationship, both business and personal. He was a thoughtful gift giver. I'm sure Cindy can attest to that. When I was performing with my band, Earhart, he secretly had a performance jacket designed and made for me. He was so excited and I was so touched. When things got tough at work, Neil and I created the drawer of desperation, which was a drawer in the conference room full of chocolate. So anytime things got rough, we were at the drawer of desperation. I also stashed a tequila bottle in the ladies' room, which he actually knew about, but he knew I would probably never drink. He was always willing to let me rehearse in the studio with my various musical groups, and when needed, he provided the photography for our promotion. Last but not least, he wrote the Arts Council 
the Neon Bridge, the Bukowski Bridge of Lights. And tonight at 7 p.m., it will be lit proper in honor of Nia in Purple Felton. Nothing would please him more. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Paula, and thank you all for coming today. Um, I first met Neil as a, uh, my teacher at Centenary College. Uh, I took his art class, his photography class in 1987. And then since then, as I'm sure he was to all of you, we had many uh, different roles and different relationships. Um, he was uh, a friend, certainly and a collaborator, and one time I even died for Neil. Um, he, he was recreating a famous photo of an uh, um, anatomy class, a, a portrait, which I, I, the name escapes me now, and the year was taken. You might know Bruce. I did they have nettles, maybe? Yeah, it, it was in the 1800s, I believe, a famous oil painting of a uh, uh, teaching theater in, in, for medicine, and that's it. So, and, it, and it's, they wanted to recreate it for the med school uh, and update it, and so he called me and said, if you're not doing anything, would you come be a cadaver? <laughs> so we showed up at the med school, and uh, they put me on a gurney um, and, and opposed me like the pose, and they had modern instruments and modern uh, uh, you know, med medicine, whatever, modern setting for this updated photograph, and they hung the two side by side in the School of Medicine, um, which I, I have a copy of it somewhere, which <laughs> I'd forgotten about it until we just started talking about this. He also liked, he was very inclusive. Um, one year he was throwing, uh, he used to throw New Year's Eve parties on the roof of his uh, building, and Aaron and I couldn't go. So he included us on he, 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 thought, he said, come to the studio, I want to photograph you. And it was the year the iPods had come out, and there was the ad campaign where it was black silhouettes and the white cord running around. So he shot us dancing in a silhouette, and they printed it on four colored postcards, which became the invitation. So we were allowed to be a part of the celebration he was having. And so I'm glad you're all a part of the celebration we're having. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, Steve Aiken, uh, with the Shreveport Opera to be our next speaker. Thank you. Well, first, I, I'm just honored, Cindy. Thanks for asking me to be here. Um, I'm an Alaska kid who, who wears shorts to work almost every day. And I'm in here wearing a sweater because I think 90% of the time that I ever saw Neil, he was in a sweater vest. And I thought, you know, I don't own a sweater vest. In fact, Neil, you're the only one I know who owns a sweater vest. So um, I didn't feel like going to Goodwill to find one, but I, I own one sweater and I'm, and I'm wearing it today. Thank you, Neil. You know, um, you know there are a few things that, that uh, we will all say about Neil which is, he was just the nicest guy in the world. I never saw Neil mad. I saw him get frustrated one time during a photo shoot when I was trying to take photos of him taking photos of, of the photo shoot for the opera, and, and he said, you know, stop doing that right now. Just stop doing that right now. We're in the middle of this. So one of the one of the things that uh, I was I was surprised because you know Neil doesn't get mad and and Neil certainly doesn't get mad at me I mean so but yes he did and yes he does so um, you know Neil was uh, such a kind man and I know we all have stories about his kindness and his smile and uh, he, you know what Neil did for us is volunteered to take photos for all of our opera posters. And I think I counted up, there were 42 photo sessions over the years that, that I've been here. Um, it, it didn't matter what I brought to him for an idea. Once, in fact, I can't even remember if I brought them. Um, I'll, I'll do this one first, which is once I brought him these little Kokeshi dolls and a, and a samurai sword for the Mikado, 
And he complained, he said, they, they, we're not gonna be able to do anything with this. We're not gonna be able to do anything. And he, you know, an hour later, we, we had this, which was, <laughs> which, which I just loved, you know, I just loved. Who, who here knows John Bogan? Well, we did, we did HMS Pinafore a number of years back, and, and I said it'd be nice to have him with a, with a steering thing in a ship and figure out. And of course, this is what Neil ended up with, <laughs> which, which, you know. And we literally brought in a tub, and I had to go make a bunch of suds, and we had to dump them all over John, and then in the end, Leo put in this little rubber ducky that he, he did via, you know, he did via, via whatever, Photoshop stuff. One of the most interesting shoots over the years was when we did the opera Dead Man Lacking, because I said, I'm not sure what we're gonna do, Neil. And then he had a great idea, which is, he called whoever he had to call in the city, and we actually went to the old city jail up upstairs downtown and we did a dead man walking shoot which was just so cool um and this is where this is where he yelled at me <laughs> it's it was during this shoot um how many here know logan sledge yeah i mean obviously you know logan and how many here know the strand theater well of course everybody knows the strand well, how great is it that the opera could do a version of West Side Story and Neil, we got there at like six in the morning and did a shoot of The Strand and, and kind of an iconic photo with uh, Logan and our young artist, Flora Bell. Um, it, it, it's amazing the ideas that would take place over just a, a short period of time I don't have the poster. One of the one of the sittings was uh, many of you might remember Lori Sheremy, who we used to work here. If anybody remembers, raise your hand. Yeah. So we were doing a, a photo shoot for a little version of Carmen called Tragedy of Carmen. And any of you who have ever done photo shoots with with Neil know that he first does a couple of test shots. And he did one test shot and looked at Lori and I, I just commented, I said, boy, that really looks good. And Neil said, no, 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 no. And, and for, yeah, for 45 minutes, we would have Lori look this way and frown another way and maybe smile or look down or ruffle her hair or mess up her clothes or do something. And then 45 minutes later, and, and we start going through the photos and Neil and I looked at each other and went, I think the test photo, that very first one, <laughs> And sure enough, that's exactly what we use. But we have to go through a process. Um, you know, we, we did a few years ago, and we're actually, uh, in honor of Neil, we're doing this opera next year. Yeah, I can. <laughs> Tosca um, was not the first opera that, that was, I should interrupt and just say, Neil and Cindy's first date was at Madame Butterfly. I got a big platoon. Tosca, this photo shoot is so special to me because all it is is a, is a letter opener. <laughs> That's all it is. And we took many photos of it. Many photos of, of a letter opener, who would think? And we literally dribbled fake blood and did that. But when Neil adjusted the light, we both saw the T in the shadow of that letter opener and knew that we had a Tosca poster in that very moment. I don't know if I would have seen it if I wasn't standing next to Neil. I mean, he had such an eye. The, um, the next one I'm going to show you is that Carol Langland posted this on Facebook. If you saw her, her post, it's her daughter, Bailey. This took about six people to do for Carmen, which Neil, I called him and I said, I just would really like red. I would really love red. 
and I don't know what we're going to do. And Neil called a few days later. He said, let's have a photo shoot in two days. Baby can come and do it. And I bought like 30 yards of red fabric. And it'll, it'll fold out to be six feet wide, and we'll just do stuff. And we tried for two hours draping and hanging and holding. What you don't see in all this is Carol over here on a ladder, me over here on a ladder. We've got a fan going. We've got, we've got someone behind trying to hold things up. But this result is, is Neil's work and his eye. And I'm happy to say this is also an opera we're going to do next year. And we're going to use both these images, if that's OK with you. So the final thing I'm going to, I'm going to mention is um, the final poster, which we have about a four foot square poster of this at the office because it was so fun to do, which is our Turandot poster. But many of you may have, have seen, he, he had this, I think he had it here for a while, but um, the background is simply a block of ice that we brought in, and he took that photo. This is from Hobby Lobby. <laughs> and this is our chorus member, uh, Samira Maslum. And this, this just became an iconic poster for us. And the time that it took of, of Neil adjusting the ice and adjusting everything in it to make it look just absolutely stunning really speaks opera to us. Um, and so I miss, I miss Neil. Uh, I can tell you so that I at least end on a funny story. Um, I told Neil a very off-color joke one day. And uh, Neil and I both laughed so hard at the end of it. I was laughing because he was laughing, and I couldn't, couldn't control myself. And, and I said, watch it, Neil. Um, you know, you might wet your pants. And, and he said something like, well, I might have. And I said, well, you know, the hard thing is, Neil, at our age, that that can happen at any time. It doesn't really take a joke. So uh, God love you, Neil. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Steve, and thank everybody again for being here and being a part of this remembrance of Neil. Um, I met Neil when I uh, came back to centenary. Jeff and I came back to centenary in 1983 to teach as an associate assistant professor back then, and uh, Neil was already teaching at centenary. He was teaching this photography class, and over the years, I built him a studio. I mean, I built him a dark room, and and then we took a, dismantled the dark room because we didn't use dark rooms anymore. <laughs> Finally, I mean, we went through the whole system of photography I did with 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 Neil from, you know, teaching kids how to do negatives on the with an enlarger to um, working with digital photography on a computer, and uh, all of that time was a was a one way that I knew Neil. But of course, all the other ways, as all of us know Neil in more many more than one way. I'd like to introduce um, Scarlett Hendricks right now. She was uh, uh, in a studio with Neil for about eight years. And she also took one of his classes, I think, from Zeth. Thank you. Thank you. I can just hear Neil saying, Hey, Scarlett. <laughs> Cindy, I'd like to start off by thanking you for allowing me to share my memories of Neil. It's an honor to be here to celebrate Neil. To know Neil was to love Neil. For me, Neil was a friend, a mentor, an inspiration. Neil loved photography. He loved his friends. He loved Shreveport Bossier and Louisiana, and mostly Cindy. Yeah. Neil helped me grow into a professional photographer, and that's what I want to share today. Early in my photographic career, I joined the Shreveport Photographic Society, led by Jim Lawrence, who taught me the traditional method of darkroom printing. Uh, during the late 90s, Neil came to speak at that group. And uh, I thought, oh my gosh, Neil, 
It's good that you're not. He's a photographic genius. And I seen, uh, so it was very special to see Neil and just in awe of his work and to me being in his presence. Uh, so about that time uh, of my career, I was uh, in a studio with Marianne Elliston and Ann George. We were young and ambitious photographers. And we all looked up to Neil's work as the gold standard for photography and street pro In 2003, us girls disbanded our joint studio as we were all going off in different photographic directions. Jeff, my husband, said, you should see if Neil would rent you his bottom floor for your studio. It wouldn't hurt to be sharing a space with the pro Neil Johnson. I'd gone to uh, Neil's opening of his studio at the old Jitney Jungle Building on Louisiana Avenue years before, and I'd loved what he had done with that space. I asked Neil, and he said, yes, I could potentially go into a studio, but only after he'd come over to the house to check out all my photo photography prints laying all over the floor that I'd printed from the dark room. And he, he said, hmm, well, okay, I can see some potential in you. <laughs> <laughs> and that began, that began our sharing the studio for eight years. During those eight years, Neil and I shared experiences and ideas and our love of photography. During that eight years, we worked in the space without the least problem or conflict, which is pretty amazing. Except once, you break the notes. <laughs> when I had taken the garbage can to the edge and I didn't point the direction that the arrow the right way, I got corrected and I learned how to directly park the trash can to the curb. Yes. That's what's meant. Uh, during those eight years, I shared ideas, experiences, and I loved photography. I said that right, sorry. He was always a gentleman and a pro, and he treated me as those who spirit. He, he was the owner and the more experienced photographer. And there's a point in time where another photographer was wanting to come in potentially for rent. And Neil's like, well, maybe. And he said, Scarlett, I need to talk to you about this because I want you to weigh in on this. And it was, it was so painful that he wanted my input to see how that would work for all of us, you know. And we decided that it would just be best for the two of us and for Paula. It's Oh, and speaking of that, um, fortunately, Paula was there to keep us organized and coordinated. <laughs> a particular highlight during those years was working with Neil and Shrek on the Triumph Over Tragedy project. Featuring elders from the Great Depression, Pam, I will always love you for getting me involved with the project with Neil. Thank you so much. In 2011, I had the opportunity to buy the building at 1311 Louisiana between Neil's studio and the Village Grill. It was sad to leave Neil and Paula, but at least we were neighbors. Neil and I would, oh, and, and that jokingly, Neil would say, we've got the, the, the Shreveport photo district right here with our two buildings, so he really kind of like our photo district. And we still had kids each other's studio, so we wanted to borrow stuff, whatever. It was fine. And we liked uh, our discussions of our favorite photographic legends, Richard Avedon, which my favorite print is, was the poster in Neil's office, Davina with the elephant is a famous shot, and so we share that. Mary, Mary Ellen Mark, uh, Sebastian Salgado, and the first famous portrait photographer, Lorraine Degla. Over the past two, days, two decades, I've shared many special moments with Neil and Cindy. Neil asked me to be in his studio to photograph his marriage proposal to Cindy. Later, I photographed their wedding. Sweet. And it was most meaningful that Neil asked me to photograph his last studio session before he sold his building to retire the last session. Well, if you're listening from some celestial photo studio in the sky, know that we miss you, 
but we will never forget you. Thank you for having shared your art and heart and your passion, passion for living and your friendship. Go on to your next journeys, past your Louisiana journey. Bruce and I came back to Centenary uh, to teach in 1983, like Bruce said earlier, and we both met Neil that year, who was already teaching there. Um, Neil was a, was a year younger, but he started breaking us in to being back in town and what was going on in the art world and just what was possible in Shreveport Bossier at that time. And so we started a, a long-lasting uh, friendship with Neil. Um, unlike Alan, I didn't get to be a cadaver, okay? <laughs> but I did get to be a ghost in <laughs> in a 1996 book that he did called Ghost Night, An Adventure in 3D, which uh, Neil has uh, 3D glasses in the back uh, for those that uh, want to sort of see. I'm not sure that it's a totally successful book. Uh, probably the ghost wasn't scary enough. Um, but this to me is such a symbol of Neil's creativity and his, his adventurous spirit. Um, he was never without ideas and always coming up with new ideas, always pushing the envelope, if you will, to, uh, to think what could be next? What can we do that would be interesting and cool and beautiful and exciting here in Shreveport Bossier? And so for me, Neil was very much an inspiration uh, to get involved in town, to be a volunteer, uh, to create uh, a world here that we could all be happy in. Um, when my friends who live elsewhere in the world uh, say, Jeff, why did you return to Louisiana, where I'm from? But why did you go back there? Why did, wouldn't you as an academic want to live in Ann Arbor or Madison or Berkeley or Cambridge, et cetera, et cetera? And I said, you can't beat the quality of human interaction here in our hometown. <clears throat> and Neil and Barita. And I think that, uh, so Neil uh, was among the best of us, okay? There are a lot of good people like Neil here in town, uh, but Neil was a, uh, an inspiration, a leader in showing us how to create a better community. Uh, about the only other person, well, actually there are many, but I say one person that, that comes close and maybe in some ways even beyond um, doing that very same thing is Lane Crockett. Uh, Lane, uh, I, I met when I came back in 83, who was a critic uh, here for the newspapers. And uh, Lane, as much as anybody, um, embodied what Neil embodied, which is a spirit of uh, openness and giving and, uh, and creating an atmosphere in which we can all thrive. So, Lane, why don't you come up and say a few words. I am not a public speaker, so if I get through this, we're not all going to be lucky. But I want to say that my friend Neil was a Renaissance man, and I thought, is that tried or what? So anyway, I looked it up. And it was a description of Neil. It said, someone with insatiable curiosity, and boy, I knew that. <laughs> and over a range of topics, and especially in the arts and sciences. And so, bingo, there he is. 
And we just fell into a habit. I've known him for years, but when I retired is when we really got to know each other a lot closer. And uh, we became close friends. And so we would meet at Dan's. Do you all know Dan's? It's a, a Ariel restaurant on Erie Drive. And I was waiting for him one morning and he comes in and he sits down and he says, I'm gonna write a novel. <laughs> and I said, what? He said, I'm gonna write a novel. I said, well, what about? And he said, Daguerre, do you know who Daguerre is? And I said, well, I know the Daguerre type, is that who you're talking about? He said, yeah, but you're the type of person I need to be writing to. <laughs> so anyway, um, he asked me if I'd be a reader on it. And I said, sure. And I started learning a lot about photography I didn't know. <laughs> and uh, then midway through him writing that novel, he started talking about Matthew Brady. And he said, do you know Matthew Brady? And I'm thinking, was he an actor or what? And he said, no, he was a photographer and he photographed the Civil War. And he said he was the only one that photographed the Civil War. And so I started reading that one as he was doing it. And you know, he was becoming a very accomplished writer because he had gotten a writing coach in California. So I told him, I said, you know, anything that I have to say, Please. Thank you. don't do it unless you ask your uh, guy in California because I may be steering you in the wrong direction. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, I want, I want to know what you think, first of all. And I said, I don't want to mess your style up because I know what can happen if people start talking about how you need to do it. And it's not going to turn out that way. But anyway, we, we did a range of subjects. I mean, he he's wanted to know about film. He wanted to know about theater. He wanted to know about books. And we even let Cindy come a few times. <laughs> and... Uh, I'm telling you, I, I miss those conversations because I don't get much of a chance to do that anymore. And another thing that Neil that, that left me with and what I always treasure is that he taught me the beauty of small things. And I, that came really from uh, the port of uh, Louisiana. And Andrew Million, who's a friend of mine, wanted to give me one day. She once said, came by the paper and said, can you come out? I'll take you to the port and give you a tour through. So we go out there and we're looking and I saw this huge picture of a coiled rope around a piece of uh, equipment. And I thought, you know, why is this beautiful? It's really pretty. It was a huge, huge. It was in the main entrance. And so we keep going through it and I keep seeing these pictures. I'm thinking, wow, that's really neat too. So I asked Anne, I said, who took these pictures? She said, Neil Johnson. And I said, oh my God. <laughs> I said, you know, so I asked Neil when at the lunch one time, I said, Neil, one of my favorite pictures, period, is this rope called around it. I said, how did you come up with that? He said, well, you know, when Gramillion and Pew gave me the assignment, he said, I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> and then I thought, oh my gosh, why did I mean to? <laughs> so he went out to um, the port and he walked around and he thought, well, you could take a picture of the river in the port and say, look, that's what it is. But he didn't want to do that. So he saw this car rope, and so he did a really close-up on it, and then he started doing that with other equipment pieces. And so I thought, my gosh, they're, they're beautiful. And 
another thing that he led me into was, was looking at buildings. <laughs> Doesn't that sound wonderful? <laughs> but anyway, he came by the office one day and he said, I want to take you around. I said, okay, doing what? And he said, well, let's go eat and let's just drive around. So he started showing me these buildings. And he said, what do you see there? And I said, a building. And he would say, no, Wayne, look again. And so I'd look, and I said, well, there's some little curly cues up there. <laughs> he said, that's all part of it, but this is a beautiful building. Now, you need to know that. And I said, OK, OK. <laughs> and uh, then we went around town, and he, he I can't go downtown without looking at the damn buildings now. <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, OK, Neil, I see what you're talking about now. <laughs> so um, uh, I can't tell you how many times we just simply rambled and talked at these, at our little lunches and stuff. And I have to say that I'm going to miss them very much, and I do miss them very much. And I miss my friend Neil. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next, Bruce? Give me the open mic. Oh, open mic, excuse me, I forgot. Yes, this is open mic Sunday for Neil Johnson. And uh, yeah, so we, yeah, what we want to do now is open it up to anybody if you'd like to say a few words. So, Andy, you're a talk after that. Uh, this this end's going to come kind of rasp him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's cool. We have Bert Hyde. We have a representative from there. We have a kind of put microphones. Yeah, we have some we have some traveling mics. They were they were taken from us earlier in the event. But I think you represent Bird High class of seventy two, so you need to come on up anyway, Yvonne. I thought it would be nice to talk about Neil when he was a younger person. I met him in the fifth grade and he was just as special then as he was in the end of his life. And I have to tell you a couple of things that I did to him. Um, <laughs> I, my dad had a 429 LTD station wagon. He was very fast. And, I, and, and most of us know where Thrill Hill is. And I figured out that if I floored it at Paramount Light, I could get air without you know, bottoming out. And since there were no seat belts in the back seat, and I was in a carpool with Neil, Every morning, I see Neil pop up and go like this, so he wouldn't hit his head on the hand you know. And uh, one more time, uh, going to church, going from church Sunday night, and for some reason he had the windows down, and I started to roll him up, and all of a sudden I hear this sound, and I didn't realize that Neil still had his head out the window, so all I could see was <laughs> like that, and so. I almost killed him that time. Um, but anyway, he, he was an incredible, incredible person. From early on, I knew he might be famous. And, and again, I can't say how much, but I knew he loved Cindy so much. It was everywhere. And I never saw Neil really show those kind of emotions before until he fell in love with you. And then it was just everywhere. So, thank you guys. I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Neil was my friend. <laughs> and when you think about friends, you feel like you are the special one. And I felt very special to be a friend. Neil and I would talk, and there was a large painting that he had of Captain Henry Shreve. And we worked diligently to try and sell that large painting to the city and other entities, and no one seemed to be interested in it at the price that we were talking about. And it ended up at Captain Shreve 
high school. Um, An appropriate place. There are those who know that I'm a car guy. And at one point, Andy Sheehy was photographed with a chicken. <laughs> and I was photographed with a motor and a big wrench. And Neil was very kind. Uh, Art Port was something that we did, and Neil photographed all of the paintings that were to go in the catalog. So we had a large painting, and we had a six inch by six inch towel. I dropped my pieces off, had the towel wrapped very securely, and by the time I got back to my office, Neil had called me. He said, Henry, we need to talk. <laughs> and when he shared with me what had actually transpired, I was very upset because I had wrapped it up and when you drop a ceramic towel, it shatters. And Neil said, you need to come and we need to talk. He was so kind in saying to me, we can repair this, we can make that happen so that no one would ever know that it was broken. The original copy that was done, I think Pam bought that in the live auction at the airport. And later Neil called me and he said, I would be honored if you would allow me to make a copy for myself and a copy for you. It's on, on his wall. Okay. And the one that he gave me is on my wall. And we would go to lunch periodically. And I will tell you that I was honored that Cindy and Neil invited Mary and me along with some other people. And since I don't see any of them here, I will not call their names. But we were honored to be a part of a dinner at their home. It was pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And Neil and I would meet with no agenda. You know, all too often we deal with people who have ulterior motives and that sort of thing. It was just a meeting of the mind. Whatever this conversation would go, or whatever direction it would go, that's what we talked about. That's a friend. And by definition, a friend is someone who is there when everyone else is gone. Thank you. You can come out there. You can miss. Yeah, it's. Then just. Hi, Mike. <laughs> so good to see you. <laughs> oh, my. So, Neil was my friend, too. We, we met in, I think it was 83 or 84, when he had his uh, China exhibit up at, Centenary, or at the Meadows near Centenary. And he was my first real friend as I was getting a divorce. And we used to just discover there were so many things that we loved it's, it's passionately. We were both uh, coming from the communications world, so we had been at the Journal, but not at the same time. We'd actually been at Southfield, but he was two years older, so I didn't really get to meet him until 83 and 84. And we, we would just love photography and writing and culture and the fun things that we were doing in Shreveport. And at the time, I was working at the Shreveport Chamber of Commerce, and I was the uh, communications director. And uh, we had budgets for photography and was able to hire Neil, um, especially I, toward the end of my time at the Chamber, I was the editor of Shreveport Magazine. So I was... Be being able to hire Neil to come and we would just collaborate and it's that time of being able to have like an idea or a spark of an idea and the way that it would just start little and then it would just turn into this great adventure. Um, and I actually left Shreveport in 1985 and I moved to San Francisco 
But that did not stop our friendship at all. Um, he started dating my best friend here, Rita. And uh, when after they got married, um, had the family, anytime I came back to Shreveport, um, I was, you know, being able to spend, year, you know, time. He's one of those priorities, coming back to Shreveport, got to, got to see my friend. When, before I left Shreveport, though, we were um, talking about, like, okay, if you go to San Francisco, you're going to have to figure out how to hire me there. And sure enough, <laughs> um, I got a job at... Uh, the San Francisco Chamber, and I was the editor of San Francisco Business Magazine. So yes, I got Neil out to do these uh, um, different feature articles, and I think the most fun one for us is in the Mission District in San Francisco. He was taking um, photographs of all of these beautiful murals that were around town, and I know. Uh, we, we had those memories together. I had the opportunity to go to Maine and spend some time on the uh, Yarmouth Island, which was probably Neil's favorite place to be. And uh, I, I couldn't really understand why I got so excited right before we went to Yarmouth. We were in Portland. And he said, you're just not going to believe what we're going to get to do tonight. You're going to stay up all night till we can do it. And I'm like, what? What's that, Neil? We're going to go shopping at L.L. Bean. <laughs> I'm like, well, can't we do that before, like, in the middle of the day? And he goes, oh, no, no, you got to do it in the middle of the night. That's what's so fun. So <laughs> we all charged there at L.L. Bean and... and uh, over the years, just kept, continued to have memories of togetherness, and I got to meet Cindy just a short while after he did, and I knew instantly that it was the love she, the love for him to and we just have all gotten to have this extended family together. And I moved back to Shreveport. Uh, let's see, in 2014, to help my mom before she passed away. And it's, it's just, it was like coming back home <laughs> to have, you know, a friend like Neil to be able to just celebrate where we were, where we were going to be, and even in just the last days of his life, um, had some really spe very treasured, time with Neil, and he was just so happy about his family, Rita and Cindy and the children and Cindy's children, and um, he was just grateful. He really was expressing his gratitude for the family that he had here in Shreveport and the, create, the creative world that he lived in, and the excitement for his second novel. Thank you. Over. And, you know, he just never stopped learning or creating or being enthusiastic about whether it was the next meal with the glass hat <laughs> or, you know, just he was, he was my friend, but he was everyone's friend. And I think he... I would say, as I watch this, just from a distance, that if you got in his little inner orbit, you'd feel like the most special person in the world when you were around Neil, because he would celebrate love and celebrate the people that meant so much to him. And that includes my partner, Bob, who's an iPhone photographer and posts things on Facebook all the time. And Neil would constantly send him a text and say, beautiful shot, Bob, beautiful shot. And how he just would really just acknowledge um, and mentor, you know, with such generosity. He had a, you know, just a generous, <laughs> loving heart and immense kindness and a great dad. So, thank you. Oops. Thank you.
My name is Kay Brown, and I first met Neil in two ways. Um, my husband was retired from the military, and we came back to Shreveport to live, and he went to Centenary and worked with the public development and scholarships. And first of all, we had a son that was at Centenary named Greg, and Greg took a photography class from Neil. It was his very favorite class. He loves photography, and he still loves to do photography today. But the first time that Bob and I met Neil was on a trip to China in 1983. It was a wonderful, glorious trip. And I remember Neil going all over China with his camera, taking pictures of the children. And the children were amazing and very fascinating to watch. We even went and visited a Chinese kindergarten. And Neil wound up making a book and it included lots of pictures of those children from China. I actually have given it away to a grandchild. I no longer have it, but I have the, I have the, the memories here. So one thing you may not know that Cindy and Neil did is they hosted the Centenary College Choir many times in their home before a Rhapsody concert they had dinner, we all helped host, and this great conversation taking place, and I always loved when some of the alumni from the Centenary College Choir would come back, because that trip to China was a Centenary Choir trip, and uh, I even remember Andy's mother was on that trip, Virginia on that trip, and Andy as well, but the last conversation that I had with Neil. He was sitting on the hearth of his fireplace at home, and I was sitting across from him on a, the sofa, and we were talking about travel, and there was an upcoming trip, and he said, well, I don't know if I'm physically gonna be able to do that trip, and I said, well, I don't think I can anymore, you know, either, it was a pretty strenuous trip, but, The words that Neil said to me as we were sitting close like that was that, you know, all those memories that we'd had, but he told me, and I've shared this with Cindy, that Cindy was absolutely the love of his life. Again. And I know what it's like to lose, lose the love. Do you see? I don't have near the long history with Neil that a lot of you people have. Um, my wife started walking with Cindy when they moved in down the street from us. And, uh, you know, I... I didn't really know Neil, I knew of Neil. But we got to be friends and we started uh, having dinner with Cindy and Neil all the time and they would come to our house and we'd go to their house. And then Susie and Patrick started, you know, joining in on that. And we, you know, we started doing dinners, the three, the, the six of us, we rotated dinner at our different houses. And uh, I just know I'm gonna miss, I missed. And uh, I'll tell you two things. I, Neil and I had a fondness of, of colorful socks. <laughs> we both, we shared. And today, I've got on, um, these, these are my Neil Johnson bacon socks. And uh, Cindy let me have some of Neil's socks. And, uh, and one other thing I'll share with you. Uh, Neil, and you probably all, a lot of you know this. Neil was a humongous Saints fan. And, uh, you know, I, and, and I'm, I'm somewhat of a Saints fan, but I'm really a Cowboys fan. I, Patrick and I are both Cowboys fans, big Cowboys fans. But Neil, it never failed. When the Cowboys would do well, Neil would text 
Patrick and I. Way to go, Cowboys. Well, when they did that, he would say, I'm sorry about your Cowboys, to, to Patrick and I. So I just want to say I'm, I'm going to miss you. That is so happy. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm Christopher Coe. Uh, Shrek, thank you for doing this. And Cindy, my God, we love you so much. And I, I don't know how this is for you, but uh, thank you. Thank you for being there for him. Uh, you can tell there's a theme here that everyone who knew Neil thought you were Neil's best friend, <laughs> which is really a remarkable trait when you think about it. I mean, how many people are like that in the world that I've known? Not many. And then... And I was sharing this with Alan, and he said it earlier. I mean, I really had never, ever seen Neil get upset. I mean, the guy was just so jubilant and effusive and affable and so curious and fun to talk to. I mean, it's just it, remarkable. And I, I do not say that because he's gone. I have never met anybody like that. I'm not like that. I learned from him. Uh, but here's what's interesting to me. Neil said architects were his favorite people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, obviously, I'm an architect. He, he never said funeral directors are his favorite people. He didn't say jurors are his favorite people. He didn't say theater directors are his favorite people. Artists, maybe you were in second to architects. He told me we were his favorite people. And God damn it, I had to believe him. I know, it never he said that I count. And, and here, here's, here's why I know it's true. Me, it, I, I knew me before I left Shreveport. Went and raised here, but I left in 87. I knew him somewhat tangentially. I was just this young kid who knew him and was all in awe of him. And I would come home, you know, for Christmas and things like that. Uh, uh, but in 2017, I decided to move home for good, and I was trying to do this ridiculous thing of trying to build a house. Uh, and Neil knew about it, and he was the very first person I called. And the reason he's the first person I called is because every time I flew in and out of Shreveport, that gigantic portrait of the auditorium of the Strand is at the front door. And it moved me every time. And it was the idea that, of course we are people, and of course love is important. Love is really all there is. But my God, for me, buildings and people, buildings and people in Shreveport, they were so important to him. And you could see the love that he had for Shreveport in that magnificent photograph. And it moved me every time I saw it. The auditorium of the Strand, I've called the heart of Shreveport, and Neil was the heart of Shreveport. And he photographed that building so lovingly, and it meant so much to me. And Neil was the greatest supporter. Whenever I needed something done, I'm there, no matter what. And he was winding things down. I mean, he didn't have to do any of that. There's two things we're doing in town, and even this, this year, in July and in January, he shot the Jody Wagner building for us. He said, I'm going to take you the best before picture that has ever happened of the Joe Wright. And I said, Neil, that's not going to be hard. It's the ugliest building in the world. He said, don't worry. It's going to look great. And I said, why are you doing this? He said, because I saw the after. The after is going to be great. I mean, he was the greatest cheerleader for Shreveport. And the Chamber of Commerce building, which we're doing, which is 100 years old, Neil's up on a ladder. He, he said, Cindy told me I really shouldn't be up on ladders. <laughs> It was raining, he should have been on the ladder, but he took what I'll call the before shot that we are now using for, you know, the after shot. So, of course, it was meaningful to me that he loved buildings, and of course, we had that in common, but my God, what a, what a personality. He, he would, after the house was done, he'd stop by intermittently, and it was like a sighting of a rare bird, or, or, or an odd duck, odd, odd duck, I'd say, and he'd just jump out of his car with his camera, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm in the yard doing work. I'm just gonna take this one shot because the top of your ceiling is robin blue, the sky's robin blue. I gotta get this shot. I said, okay, Neil. I thought, you know, do enjoy. God, Godspeed. So, uh, how can you replace that? You can't. I mean, that's all we have. But I will, I will say this to end. Uh, if we all love Shreveport and we all love Neil, who else would throw a hundred-year-old birthday party for their house? <laughs> but, that was the greatest party. The cake had the picture of the house on it. And that's how much he loved Shreveport, loved you, loved the house, I mean, three generations. So as an architect, if you love Shreveport, can we stop tearing things down? In honor of Neil, can we keep the city looking beautiful and historical and intact, please?
Let me scream my out. Ah, quick one. Okay. Lady, thank you. Then that's quick side. Oh, yeah. First of all, I, Andy and I collectively object to your uh, comment about the funeral director. So, so, just so you know, I have a video. Okay. I have a, a quick story, but it's funny, y'all. Okay. You know, everybody knows Neil is very, very ethical, right? Very precise, correct? But also, he has that left brain, right brain thing. I mean, go figure, not too many people have that. Well, I've known Neil almost as long as Andy has, but I'm a lot younger than Andy, 17 months. Okay. <laughs> so I had, way before you, okay, way before you, I had one date with Neil, okay? You think? We went out, we're having a cup of coffee, we started having a discussion, and you know what he did? He started to correct my English. <laughs> so, I have a very quick um, memory. Well, I have lots of memories of um, Neil, and my name is Tarama Davenport. And I had an opportunity before the, we always say, before the fire at Shrek, when that's where the office was. And I had an opportunity um, to be the project director for SHRAC for the Hollywood Library, where Neil and both Walter Washington, who's also deceased now, um, he died during COVID. But Neil was the kind of person, he went into that community and he embraced that community. And it was so easy to work with him from all the things that I've heard many of you say. He was kind, he was patient. I enjoyed working with him. We had meetings together with people in the community, but we also had our one-on-one -on -one meetings where it was just Neil and I, and he was putting the information into his computer. I enjoyed it so much because we knew each other, but we didn't know each other like that. And it was good to be able to have that personal, very personal, one-on-one -on -one contact when a lot of times he was showing me things in his camera or showing me things on his computer. He was so patient, so caring, and so loving for his community. Um, I could understand why all the things that you all have said that actually I became to know because I just didn't know him. I just knew of him, his popularity, all the things he did, all the things he was noted for. I always read a lot of articles about him in the newspapers, magazine. But to have that one-on-one -on -one experience with him just lift me to a whole nother level. And we became friends, my husband Jerry Davenport and I, artists over there. Um, and so I just want to thank you, Cindy. And many times we were also at your house as well. We were invited. And he was just, and I know, like everyone else, you were the love of his life. Sometimes in our texts, he would mention, I'm going to take my bride here, or things like that. He just expressed it. So we know he also had great love for all of his friends. Many times, some of you have, he's mentioned when we're talking. So I'm glad that I had that opportunity, not being originally from Shreveport, but been here since 84 that I had that connection. I have memories that will always have, and photos, some of them I told you already that I'm going to share with you and get your copies of them. So thank you very much. Andy, you're up. Andy, got one. Gee, I did into the rap one. This is Neil and I were in school together from K five through twelve. That's a long time <laughs> to be in school with someone. And my number one impression of Neil in all of those formative years was, and it's been reflected here by previous speakers, Neil never had a conflict with anyone. 
You know, when you're in elementary school, you have rival gangs. You know, somebody breaks up with somebody. Uh, Bill Steinke was breaking up with Murray Lloyd, and somebody else was. And, you know, I'd get roped into taking a side or two, and then two weeks later, you'd make up. But Neil said, I'm neutral. And in the third and fourth grade, that was amazing. He was just, he was, he was on kind of another plane, even keel, calm, and I'm neutral. And so we respected Neil for that, and that carried on to C.E. Bird High School. And Neil and I used to talk about all the important life events that we experienced in person. Uh, we learned our ABCs with Josephine Carmody in the first grade at Southfield. Second grade, Janet Butcher and several teachers gathered a bunch of television sets, which was unusual in 1962, so we could watch uh, Glenn, what was his first name again? John Glenn, excuse me. Uh, orbit the earth for, for the first time. Uh, we were coming back from lunch break, November of 1963, and Murray Lloyd comes running in and says that President Kennedy's been shot in Dallas and he might not survive. I was standing right next to Neil. Uh, later on, uh, had some, he gave me some Presbyterian influence. We went to Alpine Camp for Boys in Minton, Alabama for two years, and actually three years. Our first year, you like this, Chris, we took a train to camp. And little did we realize that might have been one of the final uh, hurrahs for passion rail service in Shreveport. Yeah. There was some banter going around. We were all getting into junior high, and some guys were thinking about going to Jesuit, which was all boys. Uh, then there was uh, First Baptist, and there was C.E. Bird High School. Well, we flew back on a shiny new Delta DC-9 jet in 1968 with these beautiful flight attendants wearing their short skirts back then. And I said, Neil, I don't think we need to go to Jesuit. <laughs> uh, and then our mothers had a conference with us, and they both said, look, Bird High School is the real world. It's where you're going to live the rest of your life, so you should go there. And we experienced the consent decree and full-blown integration, and survived and thrived all the way through it. Neil played tennis, I ran track. We finally, after uh, 12 years, parted ways. He went to Washington Lee, and I stayed home and went to Centenary College. Um, but getting back, uh, getting off track here, I mentioned uh, our junior high years. We closed out that decade. I mentioned John Glenn orbiting around the earth. And Neil and I had been, in 1969, uh, in a summer musical with the city of Shreveport. And we got to, my grandmother had a big TV and a swimming pool, so we had a cast party, now you remember this, at her house, and we got to see the moon landing, first men on the moon. So we experienced so much together in our formative years. Uh, we did graduate that May of 69, I guess you call it graduation from Southfield, and he won the all academic honors because he was always studious and uh, very industrious. He would lecture me like he did Mel, he said, Andy, you know, you really need to get cracking. <laughs> and so, that's, and uh, uh, but when Neil arrived at Bird High School, his uh, desire for academics kind of fell off a little bit to pursue the many uh, pleasures of this huge, big high school that we were attending after nine years, uh, 10 years at a small private school. And but there's a bond there, and I saw Martha McClellan earlier and they may, that may be some of the reasons why Neil didn't finish number one in the class at Bird High School. <laughs> and then you mentioned uh, Neil was a science fan. Cindy and Neil and I, I made the important sacrifice because I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Okay. But I finagled some really good seats in December of 2018, and we were down to Dome, and you got a big Christmas present when the Pittsburgh Steelers coach inexplicably called for a fake punt inside his own territory. But I was, I held sway, I was a team player. We had fun going out to dinner that night. So, yes. So, uh, and Neil, I mentioned earlier that he was always even keel, he was always low key, and everybody got along with Neil. And Neil was always there if you needed him. Sometimes Neil and I might go two or three months without seeing each other, we're busy, et cetera. But Neil was kind of like a rock. You could always sort of count on him. And uh, Neil was the chair of the, uh, this is a long title, which befits a library title, the Shreve Memorial Library Foundation Board. Neil was our chair. 
and we had our first meeting in January without our chair, Neil. But I was thinking, thinking about what Neil said about the correction of English, and he wanted me to get cracking. He'd say, Andy, you know, you need to kind of work on your punctuality. So I'm <laughs> driving to the first library meeting without Neil. I look up and I said, Neil, I want to dedicate this punctuality today <laughs> to you. And I think one thing we can take away from Neil's life, he was an optimist. Uh, he liked everyone, and I think that's a good legacy we can take with Neil. And in, in some ways, you know, I'm, um, I'm not used to Neil being gone, uh, but I also know that Neil is still with us, and, and he could be an inspiration for us how to lead our lives and how to be good uh, citizens of Shreveport. Uh, one last point, someone mentioned the glass hat. Neil's influence was far and wide. He had an influence on the glass hat. There's the manager right there. Um, Lewis Kambach and I had developed a rivalry to see who was going to purchase the Greyhound bus building on Phantom Street. So, you know, we were kind of looking at each other like in the Old West, who was going to shoot first. And Neil said, I think we need to go to a Rhinos and talk about this. Ah, the great mediator. So we get together, and with Neil's help, Lewis and I end up being partners. We're going to go into this adventure together. Well, the real estate companies kind of undercut us, and the Roman Catholic Church got involved, and they uh, offered a lot more money, so Lewis and I had to back off, so we looked towards another building on Crockett Street. And so that's how it came about. Lewis was going to be with us in that venture, but he had some health issues, and unfortunately is no longer with us either. But uh, so Neil's influence was far and wide. But just you can remember today that Neil will always be there with us, and he'll be an inspiration for us always. Thank you. Okay. That's right. And an odd coincidence, I've got to go pick up these senior citizens at the um, Street Park Symphony performance, their supplemental performance today, and I've got limo number 30 out there, and that's the limo I drove you and Neil to Lake Bissonneau for your honeymoon night. Yes. So, yes. Neil Johnson, you all have shared how special he made you feel. You also made him feel special. And no one is wrong about them feeling like they were the most special because you all were. His heart was so big that it could handle, it, the capacity could handle all of that love. The love for our community, the love for Shreveport, the love for each and every one of you, his family, he loved his children, Rita. We're still family. She died. Yes, sir. Um, he loved to champion people the arts, our community. And if I could just say, he's not here to do that anymore, but we are. It, he would want us to continue loving each other and supporting each other, showing up. It's, it, it's what we need to do for him because he did it for us. Mm -hmm. I love y'all. And I thank you so much for loving him. Rebecca Bonnevere reminded me to let everyone know that a, a guest book is back there for everyone to sign. We have lots of food and cookies, et cetera. And thank you for your attendance today. And we'll visit and socialize and remember our friend Neil. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.